Thank you for having me tonight. I want to thank Ed, in particular, all the uh, board members that are here, President Christine, Penelope, Elric, and Erica, for taking a risk and bringing me and having to share all my stories with all of you. So uh, I met at Ed Tick somewhere, you know, somewhere around 2010, and uh, one of the I've been retreating and uh, leading retreats in Minnesota at the Men's Conference there for a many, uh, for a number of years already, and uh, somebody had read his book War and the Soul and said we have to bring Ed. So the night, the opening night, we would do some sort of a prayer uh, and invocation, and Ed offered his song. And as soon as he started singing it, I recognized it. I'm going, this sounds really familiar, and I realized. It was one of the songs that one of my adopted grandfathers, a uh, uh, Creek Muscogee Creek medicine man, had taught. I had heard him sing it, and he, he taught it to me. And here it was Ed singing. I'm going, how does he know it? And then I realized this is the beginning of a, as they say at the end of, uh, you know, Casablanca. Henri, this is the beginning of a wonderful relationship. So that was twelve, almost twelve years ago, and we, we've been working together, realizing we're on the same path. So. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I want to say again, thank you and welcome all of you. So I want to take a moment from the Friday afternoon jitters. You know, I don't want everybody to just take a deep breath and just sit where, wherever you are in this world, in this country, time zone, wherever you may be. Just take a moment to feel yourself, yourself connected to the ground that you are on. However far you are from the ground, whether you're on the first story, second story, 10 stories up in an apartment building, feel yourself connected all the way down to the earth. Whatever earth is around you, connect yourself to your earth. Connect yourself to your body of water, to your mountain, to your valley, to your tree, if you got one, right? Feel yourself connected to the ancestry of that land, whatever that land is. Don't worry about a name. Don't worry about a tradition. Just feel that ancestry. Now feel that ancestry connect to you. If you were not born there, and it's likely that you weren't, feel yourself, feel that ancestry feeling you. And then feel your ancestry, which you carry with you, connect to the ancestry of the land you are on right now at this moment. What would that feel like if the two of them are looking at each other? Oh, there you are. Kind of like that. Who are you? What does your voice sound like? What kind of foods do you eat? What kind of songs do you sing? Ah, you wear interesting clothes like that. Meet each other as curious beings about each other. Feel that. Take a deep breath. And with that in mind, I'm going to start with a poem written by a woman named Deborah Miranda, and it's called Credo. I believe that the scent of ions bristling on the edge of a thunderstorm chemically alters our brain cells like the breath of a passing God. I believe that round, sage green hills trigger the heart songs of ancestors still dwelling in the ridges of blue mountains. I believe the liquid jungle cries of robins overflow from ancient fountains of praise. I don't believe in promises pulled from weeping children or lovers. I don't believe in the noble poor, the noble savage, or the born-again politician. I believe in a brilliant, distracted creator who's forgotten to feed the kids but snags no bell with that terracotta sculpture. <laughs> I believe in the languid lure of purple flocks on the road home, forget-me-nots sprouting in abandoned yards, the fervent green cries of a thousand acorns all sprouting in love at once. So that's Deborah Miranda, one of the poets from here from California. And her poems are available on Tia Chucha Press if you're interested. I'm going to share a lot of poems and stories with you. At some point in time, if you're interested in a reading list, I'll put, I'll happy to put it on, but I'll, I'll begin with my story. I was born in Guatemala and my father was a surgeon. And he was interested in uh, trying to figure out how to deal with cleft palate restorations because uh, my grandmother and one of my aunts were born with cleft palates. And so he came to the United States to do a res residency in surgery. And my mother happened to be <laughs> the woman that became my mother, eventually happened to be a nurse in the operating room. They fell in love in 1948, got married, and my father was not going to live in the United States. So he went back to Guatemala, and this is where my life story begins. So unfortunately, he tragically died in what they say supposedly was a car accident. And about this is about I was three years old, and I don't remember him a lot. But 
in his honor, my mother built a, uh, he had a clinic in the front of the house. And in the back of the house, my mother built a small hospital. My uncle, who was also a surgeon, came and took over the clinic. And so I grew up in, a, in basically front end clinic, back in hospital. You know, we'd be out there shooting, playing cowboys and Indians or burning fireworks. And my mother, they'd be in the operating room yelling at us to be quiet, you know, say, hey. And we were blowing up things while they were operating on people. We would open up the door. And, you know, a basket of food would show up or chickens would show up or firewood. And one time, even somebody dropped off a basket with two babies right in the front door. You know, my mother ended up raising them for like a two or three months. So you never knew what was going to happen when the front door opened. People always looking for a doctor. So I grew up with that. And Guatemala is also a really heavily Catholic nation. So when we celebrate, if you're if you are familiar with the, what they call the stages of the cross or the passion of Christ on Fridays, when they celebrate the crucifixion, it's a big deal. And there's usually a um, a, a big mass on any Friday afternoon, because according to the Catholic tradition, at three o'clock in the afternoon is when he got pierced and died and got the whole transformation took place. So anyway, we were sitting in uh, a high mass one Friday, Good Friday, and of course the storms come in and massive thunder and lightning storm happens, you know. And so, of course, all the electricity goes out, and I'm sitting there watching this from the back of the church. And the only thing that's are the candles on the altar is about half a dozen candles, and the only light that was coming into the church besides the candles in the altar were uh, the lightning uh, lightning bolts would come from different directions, you know, and then. And if you watch lightning bolts carefully, each one has a different tone, a different color, right? So some would come in from the left, and, it's, and the stroboscopic effects would take start taking place, you know, with all the incense going on and the, and the singing. It was really trippy, you know. For an eight year old watching this, I was like, I was in a, I was in a different zone. I had no idea what I, what was happening to me, but I realized after a while, whatever was going on in the church, what was interesting to me, what was going on outside. Because it was much bigger, vaster, and more mysterious. And you used, uh, I think, a non-ordinary reality, Erica, about a lecture that you're doing in two weeks from now or whenever. This was a non-ordinary reality moment for me in my life. And I had no idea how it would impact me. But I realized whatever goes on here, something out there that's much bigger, more interesting to me. And that's what I wanted to do, figure out what that was. And so came time, my mother got very sick, and then we ended up moving to the United States. And uh, I would always heard uh, when I was a kid, you're going to grow up and be a surgeon just like your father. Just like your father, you're going to be a surgeon. So my last two years of high school, I got a job at a, at a hospital in the small city where we lived in upstate New York. It was about an 80-bed hospital. So they, they would stick me as an orderly in the emergency room, and they would leave me there alone. <laughs> and so, uh, okay, the first thing, when people come in, I'd take the information, name, address, what happened, get on the phone and call the doctor if we were not too busy. So fortunately, I had already watched my uncle operate. I'd go into, this, into the operating room with him and I would go do rounds in the hospital with him. I would go with him and make house calls. So I understood what the part of being in that, in that service mode was. So people always thought that I was some kind of an intern, even though I was only 16 years old. So there's a few things that I learned that I observe in two years, a day on, day off for two years. So it's like one day on, one day off, one day on, one day off. And after a while, you begin to, I began to recognize certain patterns of behavior. And the one thing that was interesting to me is you know, all the surgeons that were working in the emergency room as, as, as attending physicians, many of them were studying to be psychiatrists. You know, to me, that was really interesting. If you're a healer, you're always looking for where the root of the disease was, right, or is. And to me, what was interesting to these surgeons, they've been uh, used to operating for years, taking, cutting things out, what, what they call R&R, &R, right? Crudely, remove and replace. <laughs> and this is what happens, you know, but these are, you're getting inside information right now, right? And they, they realized it was not necessarily in the body, it was someplace else. And the other thing that I recognized, I remember I was, it was a very busy night and there was maybe 30 people in the waiting room or something like that. And I was out there. What getting information for one particular woman and the look on her face, it, will, it took me, it told me a tremendous story. I remember seeing in her eyes the uh, the level of apprehension and relief that she had when, and, and I could see, I could read her in her, the expression on her face said, I am safe here. I am safe. And you realize people, what I surmise from that is people do terrible things to themselves or allow terrible things uh, to happen to them so that they could go somewhere where they can be safe. 
right? So safety is a really important factor for us human beings, especially if I was wondering what goes on in the home that they have to come to the hospital to feel safe. So after two years of this, I realized maybe that's this is not my way of, uh, of uh, this is not the way I want to live my life. So I knew that I had to help people, but I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. Through a normal and a very unusual set of circumstances, one of my cousins had a boyfriend that was a conga player. So he gifted me with a conga. He showed up at the house where we were living. He said, this is for you. And he gave me a conga. And so he taught me how to play. Years later, I found myself living in Colorado, and I would go take my drum wherever parties I ended up being invited to, and I would always start playing. Eventually, I got asked to join a, a band, and before I know it, we're touring around the country, playing bars and small concerts. And eventually, there was a very famous singer looking for a backup band, and we get you know a call from her saying, "I want you, I want you to be my backup band." So we were on our way to LA to record with Carol King, you know. So I was part of part, part of Carol King's backup band, just like that, boom, you know. So before I know it, we were out touring, and we had a record deal with Capitol Records. And uh, at one time, we were in New York promoting one of the one of the her albums and our album. And this young lady comes up to me uh, as I was packing up my gear at the Palladium. And she goes, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. She goes, I want to thank you for saving my life. And I said, how, how, how did I do that? And she goes, listen, I was going to kill myself. And I was walking around the streets of Manhattan. And then I saw the album cover, your record album cover. And, I, and something compelled me to buy it. And I started, I've been playing the music and I stopped. And I decided not to kill myself anymore. And I realized that if I'd done one thing in my life, if I had helped one person, I had already done my life's work by saving it. So I realized that there was power in the intention and the music that, I, that we were uh, recording and producing. So that always stayed with me. And eventually I decided to, uh, my time in Colorado, I was learning in Colorado at the time. And so I got used to, I said, I have to further my career. So I ended up moving to L.A. I started playing with a Nigerian master drummer. And, I, and when I didn't have time to to uh to do to do recording sessions, I would go out and what the first job that I found was basically being a cab driver. So I drove cab part time, do recording gigs, and eventually I got involved in being. Um, uh, I needed a job to support the family, so I I, I got hired as a schlep and taste for a post production editing company for for videotape in those days. This is in 1980. So about three or four months later, I get a call from this friend of mine that had a recording studio, and he said, "Hey man, that's how I used to talk." I got these girls here and we need some congas on these tracks. So why don't you come over? So I went over there and the lady, one of the lady singers, they were both Native American. And they, she, she was at the time, she was the girlfriend of the guy who wrote the book, Seven Arrows. I don't know if you're familiar with Seven Arrows, but it was a very popular book in the 1970s. So I recorded, I made, made the recording with her. I can't remember her name right now, but. Chuck Storm or Hayemi of Storm and I got to be friends for a little while anyway. And I used to give him conga lessons. <laughs> so if you can imagine that, and we ended up in the, uh, in Oxnard at a at a, uh, at a at a multicultural gathering, and the people, the teachers who became my elders and adopted me eventually, I met them at that gathering, and they were recruiting people. They couldn't find young people in their communities to teach their traditions, so we started a group in LA that sponsored these medicine men. One of them was Marcellus Williams, who was a Muscogee Creek teacher. He was the one that Ed and I are connected with. And the other one was a Lakota couple, Wallace Black Elk and Grace Spotted Eagle. We started doing ceremony, started with Chanupa, and then started with a sweat lodge, and then eventually went on to Sundance, and then on to uh, Running Vision Quest and Sundance, which is a number of things. But one of the first, when I grew up, when I was a kid, I never felt at home. In Guatemala, because I'm of mixed cultures. I, my mother was from the United States, so I'm already a half, I'm a half breed, half Guatemalan, half from the United States, you know. So I never felt at home in Guatemala. I would look at my reflections in the, in the windows. And, you know, when you see a reflection in, in the pane of glass, it's much different than your reflection on a mirror. So I always felt like I was only partially here in this world. Came to the United States thinking it was going to be better, and it was actually worse. You know, and I was going, where is home? I don't feel at home. The first time I got into a sweat lodge or a stone people's lodge, as the elders like to call it, you know, and Grace Spotted Eagle started singing. This energy comes in and all of a sudden I felt at home. I had never felt at home in this world ever until that time. I was basically 27 years old when that happened. So in the sweat lodge, one of the things that happens, you recreate in a ceremonial way, two different points. You're connected. You reconnect with two different points of origin. You're reenacting when you build a fire, you reenact the creation of the world. 
right? And you also reenact the conception, gestation, and birth of the individual. So in a ritual ceremonial fashion, you go back to those points of origin and realign yourself with them. And when you realize that a lot of us, and I've been listening to people's stories for 50 years or more, you know, you realize a lot of us are not conceived under ideal circumstances. So from the get-go, we don't know if we belong here or not. So this is a really important thing. And then through the sweat lodge, and I've seen this many times. I, I, I ran sweats for a uh, recovery facility here in LA for about 15 years. And I could tell I had to come up with a spiel short enough because I would only get these people maybe once or twice in the lodge. And then I would never see them again. But I had to infuse them with enough information <laughs> in the time that I had them so that they could feel that they got a blessing. So I would say to them, creation stories from all over the world begin in the same way. In the beginning, there was nothing. And from that nothing, it's, things begin to emerge. So imagine that darkness. My teacher used to, Wallace used to call it the holy black. So imagine the potential in that darkness, the manifestation of a universe with no galaxies, no butterflies, no flowers, no cappuccinos, no lattes, right? No vegan cuisine. But the potential for that being there, right? So we, we're going to go back to that point of origin. And I said, also, when we put, when the stones come in, you're reenacting conception. The stone becomes the sperm. The lodge becomes the egg. Conception, fertilization, gestation, birth. So in case something happened, and I'm not saying that it did, but in case something happened that disconnected you from the holiness of that moment, we're going to go back there now and reclaim it for you reclaim it for you so that you actually feel that you belong and you were blessed and prayed for when you when you were being called into this world and for many people i've seen it i could see in the lodge i could see people's bodies when i would say to them here you belong here you have a place the sense of the re, uh, finally feeling comfort and being protected when that happens you know so this is part of the uh, the tradition that was embedded in me. And you realize this has to be repeated over and over and over again so that your actually bodies can begin to, to resonate with those frequencies. What I like to say to people is atoms, molecules, cells, tissue, marrow have to know this. They have to know that you belong here, that you are loved. One of the teachers that we had, a young teacher, was uh, going a little apoplectic on us. So he started making threats, right? And so I called up Marcellus one time and I said, listen, uh, such such as so-and-so is getting cranky and it goes, I'll come over here, come to New Mexico, I'll fix it for you. So we get into the lodge in, in Santa Fe and the first thing he said after all the stones come in, he said to us, whatever comes after you is going to have to go through me first. I had never heard that said to me in my life ever. Whatever's going to come after you is going to have to go through me first. So I realized that a lot of us are not parented properly are not parented properly, right? So we have to understand how to recreate that. If we didn't get it, we have to be retroactive with our ceremonies. When we when we were sun dancing, right? It was in the early 1983 was my, 1984 was my first year of sun dancing, 84. And in those days, one of the, the big buzz uh, was celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus's arrival. You know, for native people, that's like a catastrophic event. Why are you going to celebrate that? You know, and it brought so much tragedy. But anyway, when we were sun dancing, the intercessor who was Wallace at the time said this. Your people, when they first came over here 500 years ago, could not do this with us. On their behalf, you're doing it now. So it took me a while to understand that that went into my body with a tremendous, it had an impact in me, you know. And so I realized that we can do retroactive ceremonies for the ancestral uh, lack of <laughs> civility with each other and coming together and recreating the coming together of the cultures the way it ought to have happen, happened, not the way that it did. So all this talk that's in current in the in the current uh, uh, stream of consciousness right now, how to deal with abolition, how to deal with you know all the civil unrest, is predicated on understanding that we all have a gift. And we all, a friend of mine who's a poet, I'll share some of his poetry with with you today. But his name is Humberto Acabal. He said this, roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. And so you realize that we are all directly connected to source. Without, and, and nobody has any way or uh, nobody controls our direct connection to source. And we have to remember that. 
no expectations, no uh, conditions imposed upon us. So we have to return to source. So these are some of the teachings. And these things have come into place all over again, you know. And, and they come to me, uh, and I'll share some of these. As you go along, you'll see how these things keep repeating themselves over and over again. And there's some validity to them, you know. And so the lodge and the vision questing and sun dancing brought a lot of teachings to me, you know. And one of the things that I felt, one of the things that happened to me my first year of sun dancing, I got reconnected. I, when I first stood in front of that tree, the first year that I stood in front of that tree, I felt an energetic bolt come out of my umbilicus and directly connect me to the tree again so the universe so the world became the placenta so i was connected to what i felt was the universal mother all right which is really important understand how to be connected to a universal mother or to a universal father right and the culture of those archetypal energies and especially here now in this country they're not active for a lot of people, archetypal energy is basically like a symbol, an academic position, an idea, but it's not a living reality. And this, to me, is a physical thing that has to be done, right? So anyway, as we move along, eventually I got, somehow I got co-opted. Uh, Robert Bly and Michael Mead were doing a day for L.A. here in, in 1989 or 90, I can't remember. And I knew all the guys that were the organizers, and they said, bring your drums. You know, so I said, okay, so I'll bring my drums. And at the end of the day, the guy said, oh, you played really good. So why don't you, uh, they rounded up all the ethnics in the room. <laughs> it was about six or seven of us, you know, a couple of uh, friends of mine that are Chinese origin. One uh, black man, his name was Dadisi Sanyika and myself and a couple of Latino guys. And they said, would you guys like to go meet James Hillman and Michael Mead? And I said, sure, it sounds really interesting. You know, so we ended up showing up at a magic shop on Hollywood Boulevard <laughs> in the little room upstairs. There we are. And so uh, they explained to them, they had already been running the men's retreats in uh, Mendocino and in Minnesota for several years. And Iron John was at its hitting its peak, you know, so they wanted to make their retreats more multicultural and they were interested. They wanted to know if we were interested in helping to coordinate a retreat in LA. One, they were, they were going to do one in the East Coast and then one on the West Coast. And so they both go, would you we, would you be interested in and that? We said, sure, let's, we'll give it a shot. You know, we agreed to spend the weekend together. And if we didn't kill each other, <laughs> we would we would help them participate in the retreat so eventually you know uh the people that had uh, the land where we spend the weekend he was the grandson of Eric, frank lloyd wright his name is eric Wright. they're dear dear friends of mine now but i didn't know him at the time so i ended up going to mendocino and i met melodoma Sume on, the, on my way up to the first year up there and melodoma if you know melodoma's work is very critical in terms of understanding how to reconnect ancestrally and contemporary the, the 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 energetic lines of the lands you know one of the things that i was talking about i i said you know you got to think about what this continent was like before the arrival of the europeans i said there were no prisons there were no mental institutions there were no hospitals so i know that the people there were not perfect but what were they doing that didn't require those kind of institutions he goes very interesting also there were no borders you know no fences that way you know, so what are we doing now that's different that we could figure out how to learn from those cultures, you know, but the work went on and eventually I realized that the drum is taking me all over the world. I had studied with a Nigerian master drummer here in L.A. and one of his friends was his, his name was Francis Awe and Francis always used to say this, the drum has taken me all over the world and now the drum took me from you know Colorado to LA and now it's taking me to Mendocino and then end up meeting all the leaders of, of the men's conferences and the men's retreats you know and I realized that what that was leading us we started working with youth at the time in, 19, in the mid 1990s and one of the things that we learned from working with youth is the lack of rites of passage there's no initiation proper initiation in the culture right now because a lot of the ritual structures that exist in the place right now they're not they're not deep enough they're not strong enough to handle the needs to, of the individuals especially and in, when it comes time to connect them to the uh archetypal energies right of the, of the world and uh one of the one of the guys that spent that weekend with us in uh in Malibu his name was the DC Sanyika the DC was a black radical from Watts and he was not going to have anything with any white people I remember him saying what do you want <laughs> I said, what do you what do you people want? You know, and even myself, I'm not gonna say I'm 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 a human being, first of all, you know, but they said, well, I just want to know, I was trying to figure out why we're in such a mess. And he goes, So we started talking. The DC had studied with um uh a very well-known uh, 
gentleman named Alfred Lagan, Alfred Lagan here in LA that had a an esoteric, uh, primarily black, right? But if it was very much similar to Manly Hall, if you know Manly Hall or in Manly Hall's work, there was the equivalent. Manly Hall had his place here in, in the white part of town and Lagan had his place in Watts, but it was just esoterics from all over the place. And the DC started talking to me. He's, we got interested in the elements at one time. He started talking to me about Atlantean fire, you know, Lemurian fire, Dogon fire, Egyptian fire, Roman fire, all these kinds of fires. And I said to him, did you guys ever go out and build a fire? And he looked like at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> and his answer, of course, was no. And I'm going, how can you talk about fire and not go out and build a fire? Right. After we finished the first retreat in Mendocino, you know, uh, Michael Mee said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, I had just finished 12 years of uh, Sweat Lodge, Vision Quest, and Sundancing, you know. And I said, you guys kind of do this backwards. You sit around and you talk for five days and then you pray for five minutes. I'm used to praying for five days and then talking about it for five minutes. So somewhere in there, there's got to be a, and this is what we've been working with, understanding how to impact the ceremonial life that we have, the ritual life, and bring it to the depth that it needs to connect us to the uh, obligations of the land. There's no reciprocity in this culture and active reciprocity in uh, with the world, you know? And to me, it's what people talk about, uh, uh, what is it called? Sustainability, right? Us as human beings, we have forgotten what all the gestational cycles of the earth are. And we have to share ourselves with the earth in some form or another. We take and we take and we take, but we don't give. One of my dear friends, uh, he called me up one time. I, a lot, I've learned a lot from doing weddings, believe it or not. You know, So this is a, a wedding story. My friend, he he's called me up and he goes, listen, I'm in love with this woman and I really want to marry her, but my my wife, my family's going to have a really, really hard time. And these are his words, not mine. He said, he goes, I'm Jewish and she's not. And my family's going to have a really hard time, uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm marrying a, a, a non-Jewish woman, but I want you to do the wedding because I want you to figure out. <laughs> so I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> so I realized that if I work my way backwards in the prayer, right? And I, and I said, before there was people, there was the land. Before there was people, there was the plants and the animals. And before the animals, there was the land and then the elements. And I worked my way all the way back. to, And I realized that creation stories, this is what I said earlier, creation stories all over the world start in the same way. In the beginning, there was nothing, right? But the potential was there in that dark. So and when I said the prayer in the wedding, if I work my way all the way back to the beginning when there's nothing, who's going to argue with nothing? Right. So that's the way I prayed. And that's the way when, when I do weddings now, that's why I work my way all the way back to the beginning so that nobody can argue with. Me. How are you going to argue with nothing? You can't. So you realize we all come from the same place. And like that poem says, roots tell us through the flowers. We all have our unique way of connecting to source. Right. So it goes back to that same place. So that was one thing. So Jordan in, in Jordan's wedding, that was one thing. And later on in years, both him and his wife got cancer. And uh, I realized, oh, I have to do something. So I did a lot of prayers with them, a lot of ceremonies. And Sandy ended up, uh, her name was Sandy. She ended up crossing over, you know. And at the end, we did a beautiful uh, memorial for her. But she was cremated. And the ashes, she was an avid, avid, avid gardener. And so when we did the memorial for her, we buried the ashes in the dirt in the middle of her yard so that all the roots from all the sh flowering shrubs and trees that were in her backyard, eventually she knew that they would get to her ashes and feed from those ashes. So when Jordan would see the trees or the shrubs flower, her essence would be in those in those flowers. You know, to me, it's a very touching. I, I love that story because you realize that in death we have to participate with the world. You know, in some form or another, reciprocity, right? So most people they say life is the opposite of death, and that's not the case. Birth is the opposite of death. Birth and death together make the cycle of life. You know, and this is one of the things that we have to remember how to how to generously give to the earth. I went to Peru in 2008 for the first time, and they practice reciprocity ceremonies like crazy. Every day, there's somebody sending a gift. They have these things called despachos. Despacho is a is a, is a word uh, in Spanish for a package that's being sent. <laughs> right like a first aid package like a red cross package so it's a spirit food food for the ancestors food for the old ones and this is the one thing that we have to really cultivate 
sustainability. I think Grace, my adopted grandmother, used to get on our case all the time. She said, don't pray for the earth. The earth doesn't need us. The earth doesn't need us. If the earth had its way, we'd be gone just like that. When you look at the tsunamis and earthquakes that happened in Indonesia in 2003, 2004, I think 600,000 people died in a flash, just like that. Boom. You have the earthquakes in Chile and Haiti and Japan, you know, Fukushima. Look at the hurricanes. It's incredible. So we have to, the ones that really need the prayers are us, the humans. We're not the ones that are not sustainable. How are we going to get sustainability? We have to do the inner work to really, really understand what it is that we have to, and to me, we have to re-sanctify the core of our beings in some form, in some shape, you know? If we don't do that, nothing that we're going to do works because it's not rooted deep enough in how these seeds are planted, you know? How are you going to get Congress uh, coherent with yourself? When I went to Peru uh, the first time, I was asked to be a translator for uh, two different two, uh, two different groups of people, 20, uh, 20 individuals each, and every day we had a clinic uh, and everybody would come and talk to the medicine person for an hour. And I still have the, the notebooks here because what they told us on Monday, what the, what the, what the, what the people, individuals told, told the medicine people, right? Uh, they would do a ceremony that night based on what they had told us. And the story from each individual from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday to Friday was unbelievable. And you realize that's how many layers you have to go through to get to where the real <laughs> where the real issue is deep enough where the root cause of, of the disturbance is you know where is that where is that splinter where is that pebble that's creating all these patterns you know and do you want to remove it or not but you have to understand what your relationship is to that energy to that splinter and sometimes it takes a while to, for individuals to drop down to get to that level that very intimate level and is it rooted in conception right I want to read you a poem right now, going back to conception. This is written by Alda Nolan. It's called, It's Good to Be Here. I'm in trouble, she said to him. That was the first time in history that anyone had ever spoken to me. It was 1932 when she was just 14 years old, and men like him worked all day for one stinking dollar. There's quinine, she said. That's bullshit, he told her. And then she cried, and then for a long, long time, neither of them said anything at all, and then their voices kept rising until they were screaming at each other, and then there was another long silence, and then they began to talk very quietly, and at last he said, well, I guess we'll just have to make the best of it. While I lay curled up, my heart beating in the darkness inside of her. So you realize, for me, we have to go back and re-sanctify ourselves from the point of, of conception to realize that we are connected to this world and somebody is going to love us unconditionally all the way through. And love is a really critical thing for me. Everything that I've seen that predicated has to do with how to reclaim a relationship to love. But if you don't know that you belong here, right? How are you going to feel love? How are you going to feel protected if you don't have a taproot that takes you all the way to spirit, all the way to source? How do we get there? How do we do that? So you have to find surrogates. You know, my father died when I was three years old. I don't have a living memory of my father, but I, I got to, my mother put me in boarding school when I was 12 years old. You know, this is in Guatemala. And the first week of school, all the guys were there talking about their father did this, their father. I had not a single story about my father, although personal. I knew what people had said about my father, but I had no idea. I don't remember being held by him. I don't remember his touch. I don't remember his voice, nothing. And then I realized then I was going to have to learn. I was going to steal fathering for every from every man that I met. I was 12 years old when I figured that out, you know. So I decided to learn something from each man and, and figure out how to how to get fathered. Fortunately, I had enough uncles that showed up in very strange ways. And even the medicine man that adopted us became like my surrogate fathers but if the universe will provide for you if you look for it you know so it's really important to figure out how you're going to make it make yourself available for the gifts that the universe has to offer so there's a number of things here at work you know but you realize that if you ask for help help will usually come in some form or another and you have to figure out it doesn't come where it's normally expected but it comes in very unusual ways the mystery has no formula to it you know our teachers, Wallace and Marcellus, used to be relentless about knowing. They would say to us, don't be Methodists. <laughs> In other words, they would say, do this, 
learn this well because next time it's going to be completely different. So this is what we have to deal with when we deal with with these circumstances, you know. So going back to the retreats, when I met uh, before I met Ed, we started a, a mentoring group here in LA. Uh, there was a bunch of kids that did not want to be in gangs anymore. So we went to a youth retreat in uh, up in Fairfax, and at the end of the retreat, we started. We decided to have an ongoing mentoring group here in LA, and so every month we'd put them up and sweat lodge, and then eventually many of them went on to Vision Quest, and then some of them went on to Sundance. In 1999, one of them decided to join the Marines because he wanted to be a warrior, you know. So we send them off through a sweat lodge, and then he came back after two tours in Iraq, and he was a, it was a disaster. He was freaked out with two tours in Iraq, and we put him back together again, basically by 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 uh, participating actively. I had a friend that had been in the service and was also in AA, and he knew I didn't know how to deal with veterans at the time, even though I remember putting a blessing on uh, on, on on this young man, you know. And after him going through the sweat lodge, we realized the ritual. There is a after working with Ed and working with our friend Roger Shorts. We realized that it's an office and you have to be basically uh, ordained into that office. The office of the warrior is much different than just being a soldier. You know, you're tasked with taking life when you become a soldier and a warrior. So you have to be ordained into that office, whether you actually kill or not. It doesn't matter. You're still that onus is placed on you. And it has so induction has to be a ritual process where you get put in there and deliver it out. So that there's opening and closing into the into that portal, you know. So for for this young man, it was really critical, and we realized that the need for rites of passage to begin with are critical because uh, when talking to veterans, uh, many of them, you, you realize that by the time they get into the service, almost all people that enlist are already fragmented already at a core level. The fragmentation that occurs in the service is exponential. So when they get back, when they get released, where is home? It's, it's it's really there's no place to go back to. They have no place to go to. So we have to restructure the community. So the the need to 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 figure out how to really get home, you know, where is home? Toto, right? <laughs> Doesn't look like Kansas anymore. And many of the veterans that we dealt with, I started hearing. I want to talk about what happened before I went into the service or before I went into war. But then I realized, oh, this is much deeper. But like Star Trek, there's only there's only two or three plots, you know, and I don't want to uh, I know you go, hmm, what is he talking about? But it's 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 very complicated. But really, the reality is in home. It's in what is going on in the homes in the culture. Right. My friend I mentioned earlier who did I did his wedding and then uh, the, the, the funeral. He's been working with incarcerated youth for well over 20 years. And I, I asked him point blank because I'm interested in how to deal with the prison problem that we have in this country. And I said, if you were to see a world without prisons, right, what would you say to me that would help to contribute to that being the case? And he said two words to me. He said, better parenting. <laughs> and when you realize there's no viable in many other homes in this country and in the world, for that matter, there's no viable parenting taking place. So going back to archetypal energies, right? The archetype of the father and the archetype of the mother are in shambles in the world. So they have to be restored, actively restored. And like I said earlier, these are the archetypes are not just academic positions. They're not just ideas or they're not metaphors. They're living, breathing offices that have to be lived in. You know, you got to get in there and figure out how to activate them, you know? And so this is, a, this is the challenge that we have right now is how to get out of, we are, uh, avarice uh, for information. We like to collect information, 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 but we don't process it. We don't eat it. We don't digest it. We don't excrete what doesn't work. And, you know, to me, information used in this way eventually will become knowledge, right? Knowledge digested, worked out, you know, in some form, chewed up, you know, worked out, sweated with, eventually becomes wisdom. This is what we have to do with the information that we have. And at this point, there's no intact cultures in the world at all. So everybody has a piece over here, a piece over there, or something like that. You know, so it's really important to uh, to figure out what how your piece is, uh, is where is your piece, and how are you going to bring it in to recreate the coming together the 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 wheel, what the what they call the wheel of life. You know, and this is our challenge now. Most of us are come from very mixed heritages. In my case, Wallace used to tell stories. Used to talk about. Um, 
pharmaceuticals, right? You say, imagine if you're on, you're taking five or six different prescriptions, you know, you take your first pill in the morning and then you take one after that and the pills all get into your stomach and they start fighting with each other. What are you doing here? Oh, this is my job. No, it's my job. Boom, boom, boom. Pretty soon the medications are all fighting with each other inside of you. And then you, you can, your body's going, oh, they're supposed to help me, but they're just fighting with each other, creating a lot of confusion. And then I took it a step further and I said, oh, how about ancestries? Are they, aren't they doing the same thing inside of us? And me in particular, I have my, my mother's people are all Polish, right? Her father was 12 years old when he stowed away on a boat in Poland right before World War I. Because he didn't want to get, uh, he knew the Russians were going to come, either the Russians or the Germans were going to come rush, rushing through Poland. Do Poland was the doormat for the world for many, many centuries, you know. And so he didn't want to, he knew the Russians were going to come over. He didn't want to be there when the Russians came in. Just, uh, so he got on a boat and went to New York. Her mother was also first generation Polish in upstate New York. And now my father, right, Maya, Kiche, and then Spanish, and God knows in Spain was the doormat of the world for many centuries too. So inside of me, that ancestry is going like this. What are you doing here? This is my body. No, this is my body. I went to Spain for the first time in 1989 or 1890. Work, I was working on a film. And I was excited to be there. You know, oh, yeah, I'm going to go see the mother culture, right? the mother culture. And so I get to Madrid, my first night in Madrid, and I'm feeling the land there. And I hear this voice in my head, you are not from here. Usted no es de aquí. In Spanish, usted es de allá. And what I felt, I'm going to show you, this is like a little, my little didactic moment. The marrow in my bones, I kid you not, this is what I saw in my marrow. It looked like this. This is a cloth from Guatemala. And the pattern that I saw, this is so I was being claimed by the land. <laughs> All right. So Raymond Stone, one of the medicine men that we met here in L.A., uh, he was up in the Owens Valley and we used to go sweat with him. He was a pipe and his what he's got, his great, great, grand, he comes from a long line of medicine men. And the teaching was this. Everything we are comes from the land. If we lose it, we go back to the land and the land will tell us. So we eat. All the foods that are produced in this land, all the minerals, they become our bones. They become our tissue. They become our muscles, right? Our blood is all being informed by the atoms and the molecules of the land that we live in. So the land, there's already a reciprocity happening there. We just have to figure out how to tune to that. We've been here long enough, many generations now that we've been here on this land, that we've been to hear the song of the land. So whether we want to accept it or not, we are being indigenized. Long, long story short, this is what's happening to a lot of us that are here now. So we have to figure out how to hear, hear the call of the land and understand what the ritual obligations are, what the ceremonial obligations are for living on this earth, how, going back to reciprocity. So understanding the creation stories, the songs, the stories of the land, and how do we participate, even in death, right? Uh, I mean, uh, Becker, right, wrote a book book called Denial, Denial of Death, right, in the 1920s. So you realize how much in the culture this is not being accepted in some form, and that you want to find it. But it's all in this world. It's all here right now, you know. Why worry about something that doesn't exist? It's in your imagination that could be or not be true. Let's live here now in the present. Right? There's a lot. There's a lot of material written on that. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying anything new here, but I'm just saying with you, my experiences, and actually dealing with the, with the craziness that people are trying to get out of. One of our teachers used to say, don't add to the confusion of the world. So we have to figure out where we, where we are and what we're doing, right? Sometimes our, our propensity to want to fix something is, is, is endemic, you know, and that does not necessarily because we have to understand what is really happening. And what does, what, what do we really need to do? So the first thing we have to learn really as, as a, as a process of, of participating is stopping the crazy track that we're on and seeing what is really happening. And to me, the call, when the pandemic hit two and a half years ago, the plug on the machinery that humanity got pulled, coming to a grinding halt, right? What, the, what does it take to turn an aircraft carrier? The radius is like five miles or something like that, right? That's humanity. <laughs> And right away, everybody's going, let's go back to that madness. To, to get, let's get back on the hamster wheel. It's not going to work that way. Look how fast the earth reset itself. If we just stopped, if we just pulled a plug on a regular basis every three months for a week or so, you know, 
the earth would do in, it would calibrate itself in some, such amazing ways. You know, there's a very famous quote. If you study uh, Krasinski's work, right, uh, Science and Sanity, the General Semanticist, is it's an anonymous quote at the beginning of a book, and it says, "God will forgive you for your sins, but your nervous system won't." <laughs> so we have to learn how to calibrate our nervous systems. And I feel like myself in my professional world, there's a thing called phase coherence, right? When they're trying to line up speakers with with each other and in all the frequencies. So we are as humans, we're not phase coherent with the with the rest of the world we forgot how to participate in the cycles of life and this is why we have to get faced coherent not only with ourselves but also with the world around us you know so what are the stories that are out there right that are that are uh that he need to be re-examined what stories are we following i mean if you've read to me uh somebody asked me a question they were doing an interview with me uh, last week and they sent me a set of questions and and, and if you had to recommend three books to read which ones would you recommend? And I'm, I'm racking my brains. Which which one do I recommend? Which one do I recommend? So I came up with three. The first one is one of my all-time favorites, which is a novel, 100 Years of Solitude. And then the next was a toss-up between John McPhee's book, Annals of the Former World, or uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Because you have a very amazing book there that basically everything that we've been practicing that have been taught through native ways is explained extremely well in the book. One of the teachings of Sundance, right? You know, in the Sundance, you set up an arbor. That's about anywhere from 100 to 80 feet to 120 feet long, right? Big tree in the middle, and there's a gate at each one of the directions. So the second or third year we were Sundancing, we finished putting up the arbor and the tree is up and all we got to do is get in a good night's sleep to start dancing the next day. So the intercessor, at that time, there was only about 15 of us dancing, you know? He took us to the west gate and he said, take a good look. So we stood on the west on the western side of the medicine of this. It's a big circle, right? It's a wheel, medicine wheel, if you look at it that way. And we were looking east. He said, that not a word was said. 20, 25 minutes go by. And then he said, follow me. We went around to the east gate, the exact opposite point on the wheel. And he said, take a good look. So we stood on the east gate looking west. And all he said was, after 20 minutes, same wheel. <laughs> same wheel. Took me years to figure it out what that meant, because there's a lot of teaching in that, you know. And you realize that, for me, if the earth didn't turn, right, and didn't go around the sun, one side would be completely frozen and one side would be completely charred. And a, a lot of us live in that kind of a polarization, you need the dark, you need the light, you need this, you need the cold, you need the heat, but in the proper relationship so they're not toxic to each other, but they're vital components. Like in all the polemics that are around in the culture right now, there's so much life force tied up in this particular in fascism, right? And you have to go deep enough to figure out why are they that way? They're angry because they're in pain and they're in pain because something happened to their source, their core. My friend Luis Rodriguez, poet, I've been working with him for years. You know, he was telling a story about being doing a reading in Appalachia, somewhere in coal mining country, you know. And he was in this high school. And the teacher, one of the teachers said, you know, excuse me, sir, but some of the young men would like to talk to you. And he's in the middle of, he's totally out of his own territory. Luis grew up in Watts. He's a gangbanger, was in prison. If you know his story, he's pretty remarkable. But he pulled himself out through writing. We do a lot of mentoring together over the years. And there's a lot of beautiful work done through poetry, through the arts, you know. And so they took him to this room, and there's a bunch of white kids there, you know, all hit from that part of the country. And this is what they said to him. You're the only other person besides a recruiter for the KKK who understands our pain. Just like that, right? Very significant. You realize, oh, this is a human condition. Going back to the story, tying it again to the um, to what happened at birth, right? What happened at conception? Why are we in pain? How did, how did that conception happen, right? Where is that pain rooted? Where is that splinter? Where is that little pebble, right? So maybe it's there. Maybe it happened before that. We don't know where the agreements are or what the deal is, but this is how far, how deep we have to go, right? So I'm, I'm I'm giving you little glimpses. There's a lot. I'm not saying anything new here, probably for most of you, because you you I think you've had long experiences of dealing with people, so you know what I'm talking about here. But I'm just pointing it out 
in my experience, because I've, I've I've heard a lot of stories over the years, you know, and so this is what happens when you start hearing stories. You start to recognize the similarities, you know. And I could go deeper with that, but I know we're probably going to need a little bit of a break. How's everybody? You want me to keep going, or do you want? <laughs> if you're okay, you want me to keep going, uh, Penelope? I see you're. They will think we can take me. Yeah. I'm going to give you a short story. Right, and then I'm going to leave you with a question, and, you, we know, and then we can go into breakout rooms, and then we'll come back for discussion. Unless somebody has a pressing question right now of something that I've said that they need answered right now, otherwise I'll go on with my short story. We can go into the breakout rooms. How's that sound? Good. All right. So this is my interpretation of Nicholas Black Elk's vision, and I've been telling the story in the sweat lodge for years, you know, and this is the way the stones have directed me to tell the story, right? But imagine a field totally desolate. Nothing is alive in this field but one tree. And this tree is completely, it's just one hunk, a husk. No bark, no branches, no leaves, no nothing. It's just one stump there, barely standing up, you know. All of a sudden, out of the west, these black horses appear. <sighs> We don't know if they came from the sky or from the ground or just, just come from the West, but these black horses show up. I come beautiful bunch of war, black horses, you know. From the North, red horses appear too. And they start looking at each other. And then from the East, this kind of all happens at the same time, but I'm gonna go around just for detail, for drama, right? Yellow horses come in from the East. And then from the South, white horses. You know how horses come in when they come in when they're in a hurry. From the sky, blue horses descend, and from the earth, green horses appear. You know, so all these horses are there in this field. What are you doing here? This is my field. No, I was here first. No, I was here first. And then they're they're still in their own little quadrants. They're not mixing with each other. You know, biting, kicking, neighing, rearing. You know how horses are. Uh, well, if you're not going anywhere, I'm not going anywhere either. So they, that goes on for a while. You know day a week two weeks two months who knows but this went on for quite a while and then they realized if they're not going anywhere well if he's not going anywhere i'm not going anywhere either she's not going anywhere i'm not going anywhere either okay i'm one like that and they would glance at each other and some were actually really curious after some time about what the others would be like what they would talk like what their language was like you know and some were even attracted to each other but they were hiding it from the others you know and eventually as horses are they began to prance and as they started prancing, they started getting a little restless and they started getting more and more moving. And eventually they start going around the tree, still in their own little colors without mixing with each other. As they go around the tree, it becomes more elegant, more graceful, more reverent. As it starts going around the tree and becomes more graceful, more relevant, more elegant, becomes more sacred. They realize, oh, this movement starts to come and it turns into a beautiful, elegant dance. As it turns into the dance, they all their footsteps up and down go into one area, right? And they start beginning, they start to synchronize with each other. And eventually they start to mix with each other. Some of them start to mix in the black ones with the red ones, the white ones with the yellow ones, the blue ones with the green ones, kind of like that, you know? Oh, mixing in, mixing in, mixing in. Eventually, as this thing becomes more and more reverent, more beautiful, more elegant, they start to, they, to go into a trance and eventually all the life force that this movement in, in, in being together generated goes into the roots of the tree. As it goes into the roots of the tree, it begins to rise to the roots and the tree, the bark comes back to life. Right, the, the bark becomes alive again. The branches come out, start sprouting again. Eventually leaves come back. After the leaves come back, of course, flowers come. And after the flowers come, the fruits. And so through this process of them being patient enough with each other, right? The tree of life is brought back from the, the state of desolation that it was. So who are you? What horse kind, what kind of horse are you? What is your color? And how many, what combination of colors are you and your horse too? So this is the kind of question that I will leave you as you go into the breakout rooms, right? Okay. So I'll see you back in 15 minutes. I think we're all back. So, um, 
Yep. See, procedural wise, just uh, was it? Uh, what, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, Christine. What do you go? What, how do you guys normally rejoin when you come back from the groups? Do you have somebody report? Yes, each group has a reporter, so we'll hear yes. uh, the four four reports. All right. Yep. I'm going to assign people so that I stay out of the out of the fray. <laughs> um, Benjamin Dennis is our reporter. Since oh, yeah. you know him, maybe we'll start with that. Um, I found it real fascinating that uh, we were talking about how important uh, the ceremonies, when you spoke about the ceremonies and how important they are. And uh, there was a real strong sense of uh, the grounding of having embodied experience with, uh, with the work that, we're, you know, that you were doing and, and the invitation. You made it uh, a real clear invitation to participate in that particular way. Um, also touching in with the plants and the need for more, uh, you know, how connected we can be to the earth. Um, uh, talk about the integrity of experience. Um, love the way you talk, Miguel. <laughs> Heard you before. <laughs> um, and then uh, we uh, moved into, um, let's see, the relationship with uh, the ancestors and uh, some of the experiences of people, you know, one or two of our members uh, going out into the uh, into the world and, you know, in cemeteries and so on and, and, and connecting with the generations. And um, let's see. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the phrases that came up was the, our ancestors speaking to the ancestors of the land, which I love that, which was, you know, really, really beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and then I, I brought up the idea of uh, this notion of not being parented properly and how that, that, for me, evokes a uh, an invitation to parent self and to bring that guidance to self as well as carrying it out to others. Um, you know, we've spoken in the past of of how important it is that wherever we are, we bring what we can to the to the new generations, to the people that we're working with. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, that idea for me came up real strongly through the poem. You know, the roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside and this, uh, you know, kind of Western notion of verticality that heaven is way up there someplace, some imaginal place and, and hell is beneath us. But, um, you know, I wonder if it isn't uh, the opposite, if we don't find, uh, <laughs> if we don't find our real connection with who we are as human beings and imaginal beings and spiritual beings with our connection to the earth. So hopefully I did justice to our group. So thank you. All right, what group wants to go next? How many groups did we have actually? How many groups were there? There are four groups. Elric, would your group go next? Okay, I can go next. Um, well, everybody had a lot to say, as did Miguel. <laughs> um, uh, Danny and Becky spoke about the rebirth and um, there was a consensus of really that everyone really felt strongly about the, the, um, the it's kind of the prayer at the beginning of rooting ourselves where we were and rooting back to the earth. Um, Becky spoke about uh, how important she felt it was what you said about finding our taproot, our source and reconnecting through ceremony. And she was also uh, speaking about um, the idea of reciprocity um, rather than just taking and taking, what, what do we give back? And um, Erica being in North Car Carolina by the ocean, um, she spoke about a wonder about the ancestors where she is. And then she spoke about the ocean um, itself being an ally um, in her in her writing um, project that she's she's doing, she felt very strongly that that being near that power was uh, was an alliance that she she could use, and she also um, wondered about um, the work we're called to mysteriously, each of us. And then Carol spoke about, she st Carol started us with a poem that she wrote a long time ago, which was quite lovely. 
and um, quite appropriate to the, the, um, the vision of the horses around the tree. Um, and she spoke about initiation and transitions. And um, she also spoke about younger people seeking elders and how important that is. And she, she kind of closed with speaking about how important it is to listen that we often in getting so polarized, um, we don't realize that our, our family, our brothers and sisters are in pain. And that's often what is the cause of this violence that we're seeing and that we've not been listening and we need to listen. So that's kind of a, a summary. Cool. Who would like to go next? <laughs> Penelope? You need to unmute. Rhea is going to speak for our group. Rhea, are you all? There you go. Yeah. Hi, I can, I can speak. Um, well, we had a, a wonderful group of three with Sharon and Penelope and myself, and we discovered that we were all horsewomen. We were all horsewomen. And that topic, that prompt really threw us into a beautiful uh, sharing. Um, so Sharon shared from her lived experience working with horses and was just um, observing how horses genuinely do have protocols for when they first engage, when there's a new uh, horse that comes into a group, there is a form of a, a, you know, initiation, a checking out. And she, she shared with us um, many of the different things that horses do during that process. And, um, and it was really interesting. And um, then Penelope shared some stories of her childhood, um, having uh, had horses in her life and having seen two horses uh, birthed and then die in the in the call and how that um, birth death cycle um, really was profoundly um, impacting through that experience and how she's worked with that medicine throughout her life through that experience and then um, I shared my own journey and pilgrimage this year with horse as spirit for me um, the horse always represents spirit. And um, I began this year doing a, um, a 13 moons gathering with elders, um, indigenous elders gathered to share the 13 moons teachings with community to re-indigenize ourselves as a form of restorative justice. And that took me on this journey um, to bringing our prayers to uh, Moonstone Beach, which is in uh, Rhode Island in Narragansett Beach. And um, around the Maple Moon, I ended up doing a sweat lodge. And it was in the Lakota tradition. And then, of course, the, the grandfather, which is, the, is similar to what um, Miguel was sharing of the different colors of the horses, was the blue horse. And that for me represented my grandfather of the Norse, uh, Torvald. Um, and that means thunderbolt in, uh, in the Norwegian language. And so that took me on a journey with the ocean um, to then collecting these stones as I would bring the waters every month and putting them into these tiny white stones into a horse rattle. Um, so I've been doing this as a mantra, as a meditation for the 13 moons, um, and I've really noticed the horses coming through the waves. And so there's this place where the thunder beings meet the ocean, and that for me is this birthing and deathing and all everything in between. So I was just sharing this sort of pilgrimage, which eventually led me to finding my indigenous roots here. So finding that I am indeed Abenaki and Mi'kmaq and uh, Huron and all of these other roots through my mother line. So um, I was very grateful to be here tonight and sharing and, and hearing this conversation and with our group. I'm, Thank you. I may be, oh, sorry. 
And maybe the last one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so I was in a small group with Miguel and Pete, and it was a lovely uh, opportunity just to get um, to hear a little more, to share a little more. Um, I'll just give a few highlights. Let's see. I, I was able to share some of the practices I've been doing recently, which um, are very much listening to the land around where I live and um, and also just a question about kind of being drawn to ceremony, but also wanting to be really careful right now and in our time around appropriation, um, because a lot of people are feeling that, uh, you know, colonial settler folks are coming in and grabbing some of the traditions and kind of doing their own um, spin on things. But Miguel was very reassuring about starting with just listening, that anyone can do that. And um, he often, he says he often has people listen to a body of water, to a stone, and a tree. And I loved that just as a really foundational practice um, that anyone is can can have that connection. And that um, basically is um, a track that I'm already practicing. So it was really validating. Uh, and Pete also talked about his connection both to the ocean and the forest here um, and how he's been going in and just really listening and being with the forest. Um, and how different that is, like being in the forest and, and kind of just being with and part of the forest. Um, and one of the other things I definitely wanted to uh, mention that Miguel shared near the end of our group was um, this uh, this tendency we have to, well, this spoke to me in this way as a therapist, um, when we're working with people to take on a lot of the kind of negative ener energies that can come up in therapeutics and can come up and say in a sweat lodge, he said, um, and what a big part of this work is, is learning to direct that, that energy into the elements, into the earth, into fire, into stone, that, that being able to, um, have a way, a practice of doing that can actually really help us as therapists. And that really spoke to me. He said, even just having a bowl of water or a stone as you do your own work so that it's not just coming in and going through your body, um, that there's a way to reconnect all of that to the elements and had a beautiful, um, metaphor or not metaphor, uh, reminder that, that that are typically that there are archetypal deities that um, take care of this energy that have to do with both fertility and um, you know eating the toxins basically eating those those energies and um, and that they actually because I had this this feeling of well we dump so much on the earth is it okay to continue to dump on her like if I have all this stuff in my body is it okay to dump that and he um, had a I'm probably you, you may want to speak to this more clearly, Miguel, but the, what I took from that was that there is, um, you know, if you even, I think about like kind of the microbes and thing in the earth that are, that can compost, that that's archetypal, you know, and, and, and an ability to be a filth eater and an ability to digest that stuff. So that was really helpful for me as a therapist to remember that there are ways to channel that and, um, and have that channel even more directly into the elementals. Um, so, so those are some of the, the highlights that I was, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to get into the group with Miguel. So got a few extra, extra teachings in there. Um, I'm sure I'm missing other, other things, but those are, I don't know, Pete, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, not really. I, I, I was thinking a few things when you were talking that came up, but now they're gone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Anyway, so I guess we can continue from uh, from where, where Lisa left off. Is the, and um, my teacher, one of my teachers, uh, Marcellus, who is the one now, Ed, and when, uh, uh, going back to the story that I told with Ed, right, um, we realized that he, we had, I had been vision questing and, and sweating with uh, Marcellus Williams, who was a, a Muscogee Creek teacher. The person that put Ed up to vision quest and taught him how to run lodges was William Tago. William and I vision quested together 
<laughs> for several years. So, so a lot of the songs that Ed learned that were Marcellus' songs were taught to him by Ed. So I'll, I'll, I realized, we both realized we're both, we're brothers in the same way we got adopted. But Marcellus, basically what he used to tell me is he said, you are not the medicine. He said, the earth is the medicine, the fire, the water, the earth and the air, that's where the medicine. So whatever people bring in, you make sure that you put it into the earth. That's where it gets transformed. You don't have the power to transform it. If it and you don't want it, you don't want all that. He said, you don't want all that crap sticking to you. <laughs> yeah, he had a very funny sense of humor, Marcellus did, you know. So he was really emphatic about that. Don't let it. So a lot of times I'm not interested in the details. As long as the story gets told, but the story gets told directly to the earth. And you need a transformative device. That's why tobacco is really critical to native people because tobacco has the ability to change negative energy. Right. It's one of it's one that many plants do that. Sage does it, sweet grass, cedar, they all have qualities that allow the, the, the vibration to change and to get re redirected and reassigned. So that's what we use the plants. So I was and, and it's important. The fertility deities are also the filth eaters in almost all traditions. You go India, Kali, one of the when you see Kali with intestines on one hand and a knife in another on her mouth, that's because people refuse to give her their crap, you know, and the crap has to get put back into the earth. Otherwise, it backs up on us. And I, as far as I'm concerned, this is going to sound very crass, but I feel like the world or our culture needs a, a high caliber enema. <laughs> All this stuff that's been backed up for centuries you know and that's my job is i realized that when i when i was running lodges this is people don't know what to do with anger they don't know what to do with fear they don't know what to do with resentment anxiety you know so it has to be put back on the earth these things come up because they, they they're bringing you message they're messengers that something needs to be taken care of right something's unattended so you need a way to regulate go back going back to the quote about your nervous system, you know, this is one way to regulate your nervous system. The affects, if you study affect psychology, right, they're all biological, right? And one of my teachers was emphatic about that. He goes, the difference, he was said to me one time, and this is like a loaded question. You know the difference between emotion and feeling? I said, no, nah, I, I was going to say something crazy and clever, and I said, no, and I'm glad he said, listen, feeling is biological, and then emotion is biology and biography right that's a loaded answer those those two little phrases right there you know and you realize that so many biographical events have compromised our biology and by biology i mean the configuration of the being which is spiritual mental emotional and physical right in relationship to this world and there's so many compromises you know the story that i like to tell imagine if every religion was like religions are connective devices right they connect you to source they connect you to essence and they should get at, connect you and, and get out of the way. Why the way we do, we look at uh, our practices are called hollow bone. It's a connective device. It connects you and then it's completely hollow so that you can always get through whatever whatever the deal is with the essence. Most religions are like, imagine if a, like a religion, if the mo, if when you made a phone call, right? If your phone starts, as soon as you want to start dialing the number, the phone says, look at me, I'm a great phone. I got so many minutes. I got photos. I got... And she, you never get a phone call done. That's what religions or any kind of belief system or structure are. There are that they have so many conditions or impositions on your relationship to essence that pretty soon you don't want to. You don't even want to make a phone call. You don't want to call. You don't want to connect God or whatever you want to call it because it's ah they're going to compromise you. So we, we got to start throwing some of that stuff out because it doesn't work anymore. That's why that book braiding sweetgrass is so critical because it, it puts it in a very elegant way. How, why is it this way? Talking about restorative justice, you know, the elements of restorative justice. There's a great series of restorative justice books written by a guy named Rupert Ross that deal with this from a whole different perspective. But it's, and it's been inculcated in all the teachings that we have. They all say the same thing, you know. Let's sit down and tell our stories, you know. Going back, to, I wanted to, um, I was talking earlier about the, uh, in 2003, right, um, we went back to Guatemala because um, one of my aunts was very sick with cancer. And my sister had a call and she goes, you know what? Uh, you better get over here and, uh, and say goodbye to her. So we spent a month down there, right, with her trying to figure out how to. And I wanted her to tell us her story. And it turns out that while we were there, this doctor had been treating her 
for months or for years, actually, and she never charged her, right? So we wanted to go meet this doctor. And there was a woman in her 40s, mid 40s, and she was very ill. And we went to her office and she had studied medicine in the United States. And she point blank told us she went to the United States to study medicine because she wanted to learn that the techniques in modern medicine are actually very viable. She goes, I will, I will study your techniques, but I will not study your ways. Medicine here is, 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 they call it an industry and it should be the healing arts, not an industry. It's not a business. It's not a way to make money. It's not a way to accumulate power, but it's a definite relationship. So remember I said, I mentioned the basket with the two little twin girls. That was one of the girls in the twin basket. She'd grown up to be a doctor and she knew who my mother was and who my aunt was and what the, and that was her paying back. She became a doctor and she came back to the, the relationship. You know, another story I was going to tell you, my father-in-law started talking about his uncle and his uncle was a surgeon in World War II. He ended up going to, he got sent to, uh, I forget, India, Burma. He was over there somewhere for, at the end of the war, he'd had enough. And so he got on a ship and, he, and the moment he gets to the dock, this guy comes running up to him from his unit and said, you got to go back. You got to go back. And he said, tell him the boat had left. I'm not getting on that boat. <laughs> so he said, and they because he was a captain, right? So he had us, the other guy had to go back. So he gets on the boat, right? And on the boat, he meets Paul Brunton. And, on, and Paul Brunton, if you know who Paul Brunton was, he was a, one of these guys that he was a traveler. He went to India, Tibet, Nepal, and Mongolia. And he was kind of like Ospensky and all those guys. You know, he wrote about all these amazing saints and gurus in India. And he brought a lot of what India is to the world, uh, to the consciousness of the Western world. And Paul Brunton said to this gentleman, you go, you better go hang out and meet. Uh, you got you to gotta learn about, uh, about Jung. You better go study Jung. So <laughs> he did. And he became a very well-known Jungian analyst. Totally gave up the surgery. Right. Just like the surgeons in the, in the hospitals that I was working on as a kid. His name was Kiefer Franz, and he started a union institute here in L.A. many years later. <laughs> so it goes to show you how these things, they all everybody, when, when you're looking for the roots, this is how they come around. You know, and the, the medicine, if you're dedicated to the art of healing, it always takes you to a place where you can connect the source. You know, so. The uh, when we were talking about reciprocity, right? It's important to understand the language of of the beings that we deal with. You know, we're talking about how to make friends with trees, right? And when, when I started sun dancing, my job was to go out. The first year that we sun dance, I was actually going to Vision Quest that year, but the uh, Wallace goes, "No, you're going to sun dance." I go, "Oh, okay." So I wasn't ready, but there I was. He goes, "This is what you're going to do." So our first task was to go out and cut sage. And then we're out in the outskirts of Denver, right where the plains de end and the Rocky Mountains begin in the foothills there. So we found a uh, place where there was a bunch of sage and our job was to talk to the plants and get their permission. So I stood there and I, and I had already read the secret life of plants and I had already cultivated a bunch of plants. So I knew what the deal was, you know, so I wasn't familiar with, I was familiar with the process, you know, but I stood there and I started telling the this group of sage plants what we were going to do. We're going to Sundance, we're going to pray, and we're going to fast for a few days. And then all of a sudden, I saw the shimmering energy above. The, and what I heard, what I interpreted from what I was getting back is, take me, I want to go. I want to go. Take me. And I heard that coming from many, from, and, I, and I was totally blown away. And one of the things that we do when we build the, the stone people's house, the Inipi, the sweat lodge, I have to talk to the saplings. And I say, relatives, I have come today to take your life, knowing that someday I will be food for you. Not necessarily you exactly, but one of your relatives. I will be food. I know this. And right away, you get a sense of this is what I want. I want the worms. I want the roots to eat me, just like they were eating the ashes of my friend Sandy, and they've become flowers, you know. So this is how we have to appreciate the earth as a being. One of the issues that we have, and especially with the English language, is because we use so many nouns, nouns objectify everything. So your relationship to all the elements, to the world around you is subjectified. And it doesn't mean don't speak English. It just means that you have to take an extra step to realize this is not an object. The world around you is living. I was reading, uh, if you're familiar with um, Anthroposophy books, right? Real Steiner books. There's a great book called Sensitive Chaos written by Theodore Schwenke. 
in the 1920s. And it's, the translation is horrible because it's written in archaic German and whoever translated probably just used a dictionary. And, but one of the things he was talking about how this world has objectified water, right? And water as an object, and water is not just an object. Water is an archetypal living, breathing energy. It's a sacred element, right? Look at John Lilly. If you guys remember who John Lilly was, he was a psychologist that would became one. He was like Tim Leary and all those guys and Richard Alpert, right? They would take acid and he would take acid and go into an isolation tank and hang out with dolphins. That's a John Lilly. <laughs> so I went and heard John Lilly talk in the 70s. You know? And so, and one of the things that he was talking about is how in the scientific community, right? All the scientific experiments, the first thing they do is they take water out of all the experiments that they do. We are a water-based planet, 70% or something like that, although Earth is water. We are 70% water. So whatever we do, when you study alchemy, right, they were always looking for the universal solvent. It's already here. It's water. Water is the universal solvent, right? So if you want to understand, like one of the medicine men that was my teacher said, you want to understand natural law, go, go without water for a number of days. You're going to realize how important it is, right? That's a critical. That's natural law. So Lily was saying everything that, that science does has to take water into account. Otherwise, it becomes toxic to us. So all the pharmaceutical industries, all those things, they take water out of all their experiments. So they should have water in it. And it puts a whole different relationship to, to the chemicals, you know, or to the substances that are made. So this is we have to think semantically what are the belief structures that are embedded in our in our in our in how we live right how 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 far back you go ed and i used to have conversations about aristotle and how it got codified but all those things aristotle the what they call the aristotelian wedge right this or that well for me it's not it's not this or that it's this and that and the other and the relationship to go back to that image of the world turning right or not turning, right? If it doesn't turn, one side gets charred and one side gets completely frozen. So think about that in semantically. How does that affect us? You know, the Eve story versus uh, Sky Woman story, as it's so br brilliantly described in Braiding Sweetgrass. You know, it's a great analogy for why, why we are in the pickle that we're in. Ben and I have worked a lot of retreats and we work a lot with mythology, you know. And so one of the stories that's out there that's been a, a puzzle to us is the Gilgamesh story, you know, because in that story, they chop down the tree of life. It gets cut. They make a doorway out of it, you know, so all these things begin. But so the stories come like Black Elk's vision to going back to where we were before. Look at it now. You know, we have to come together in the field and bring the tree back to life. That's our task. You know, there's no culture that's intact right now. It's rare. I, I, I'm... But I'm, I, I break my heart to try to find the culture that's intact this, in the world alive today. It's, it's almost impossible. Everybody has, everybody has a peace. So our job is to bring the peace back together again. I think Ben has used this, uh, Ben Dennis, my partner over there, the kintsugi, the art of kintsugi, the Japanese, they deliberately break a pot and then they put it back together with gold, you know, to make a new pot. And this is where we're in, something of that nature, you know. Uh, and I wanted to talk about love. A friend of mine, one of the guys that we met during the multicultural conferences, was saying, man, for a year, he was a brown beret. If you know anything about the cultural history of L.A. or New York or Chicago, you have Black Panthers, the uh, Young Lords in L.A., they had the brown berets. You know, I'm not going to get into it. But he said, I hated white people. I was never going to talk to white people in my life ever again. And then it said, then my knucklehead son fall, falls in love with a white woman. And he goes, I'm holding my first grandchild. And he's got blonde hair and blue eyes, and I cannot help but love him. I'm holding him. And he's tearing up when he's telling me this. And when I tell the story, I feel that. And I still feel what the meaning of that is, you know. Going back to wedding stories, I have so many, so many people call me when they have a difficult wedding because they say, you can do it. You can figure out how to do it. One of my favorite weddings, I have many of them, but this is, I like to tell the story. The groom's parents, he, uh, he the the father is a Hasidic man. I can't. I don't know if he's a rabbi or not. His mother was black, right? So he's already in there. 
And his bride was uh, Lebanese, and I'm sure there's Palestinian in there, you know. And I'm in the wedding, you know, I like to use feathers and smoke and everything. And there I am, and I can see the ancestors all standing in the field. Like, what are they doing here? What are they just like the horses, you know? And, and, and I said to myself, excuse the language, but I said, shit, this is how it's going to work. Love. People are going to have to force themselves to learn about each other because love has brought these people together in a way that they have to learn how to be with each other. And love is going to open up the way. Love, love will lead the way. You know, it throws. And so we have to go back and reclaim love from a very different perspective, open up the parameters of what love is. But that's it's issue, that's the issue. Going back to the story about, about the, the, the young boys that were talking to Luis Rodriguez, you know, that's love you know they something happened to their essence they were angry because they were in pain because something happened to their essence and that's love going back to that holy state before creation right that 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 dark the holy dark that wallace used to call and in inside the lodge we're in that holy dark with the possible the manifestation there is endless and you whatever you can manifest and you can have that now that just didn't happen once 15 billion years ago when the universe got made. This is available to us now. But we have to tell, we have to remember that. We have to practice that. How do you practice? You go out and talk to the trees, right? We were in Mendocino one year. And it was one of the guys that was there, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. But he was a, a really good, really cool guy. But he was, he was was his specialty was the Punic Wars, if you know anything about history. You know, the Punic Wars or the... They were fought between the Romans and the Carthaginians in 500 BC. I love that because I was fascinated by Hannibal when I was a kid. So I knew. So his name was John, right? And we got to talking. And one day he comes up to me and goes, man, I don't know. This is how I used to talk. Well, what's the deal with these trees? You know, I'll come. And we were in the, in the Redwoods in Mendocino. And I said, well, you know, think about it. We're like these little nets. These trees live to be, some of them live to be 3,000 years old. So when we come around, we're like little... So you gotta stay there long enough so that they can actually figure out how to how, how to talk to you and how to hear the speed at which we function is very different than these trees are. He goes, hmm. So we were at this retreat for 10 days, you know. The last night we were there, we're out there at midnight or something, talking about, you know, you know how you know how horses are in the field there in the middle of the night, right? So we were talking, and he comes running into the group, into the group, and he goes, guys, 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 guys. He said, the trees talk to me. I heard the trees. And he was like, he had a total epiphany there, listening to the song, the, the, the voice of the redwoods. So talking about phase coherence, right? Synchronicity. We have to understand how to hear the voice of the stones. What is, Lisa was so beautiful saying, my my stream talks to me. What is the voice of the, and who was reporting about the, the, the thunder and the horses and the waves? That's a beautiful, I love that image, you know, listening to the song of the waves, you know, the song of the earth, right? The universal sound current. When you read Hazrat Inayat Khan's books, you know, volume number two is a favorite of mine, talks about the universal sound current, what that's like, you know, and this is what we have to do. We have forgotten what that song is like. That song line, that is the song that we all belong to, that stream of energy, you know, and that's holy. And that, and nothing, nobody can get in the way, should get in the way of that, or our relationship to that is, you know. So uh, I just want to put it, I want to remind us all about this. I want to say thank you. I really, really appreciate you giving me time. And I, so I want to say love in some ways. Stevie Wonder, uh, I'll say, I'll say three things. Umberto's poem says, Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. And, I, and that's one poem. I'll share the poems and why I tell them the way that they do. His poem says this. Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. And the flowers, they wither and they die because life out here is shit. That was a, po a poem written in the 1980s about the political life in Guatemala. And he could not say it. In the, but I liked it. that first line to me is flawless. And then he says this. Love each other like the roots that with all of the power of the earth love until they burst into flower love each other like the roots that with all of the power of the earth love until they burst into flower right and then stevie wonder turn your words into truth and then turn that truth into love right so i'm going to ask you to just close your eyes for a moment Feel with your feet, feel that ground. Feel that ground you're on right now. 
wherever you are on this planet, in this world, whatever time zone you're in, feel that ground, feel that ocean, feel that stream, feel those trees, feel that forest. Feel the beings, the elementals in that forest. Feel the ancestors of that land. Feel your ancestors talking, being with those ancestors, right? And the elementals of that land. Feel yourself commune with all of them. And now, oh, oh that's how you that's how you sing songs. That's how you cook foods. Oh, you wear those kind of clothes in the winter. Oh, you wear those kind of clothes in the summer. Like that. And remember that. Just remember what that feels like. And when this world gets in your face, when this world challenges you, remember that moment. Remember this moment, because this really happened. Right? And in that vein, I will leave you with one more poem, again, from my friend Umberto. The poem says this, the answer. Open up the earth with your hands. Get filled with its scent. Raise your face to the sky and eat the wind. That is peace, the grandmother said. Raise your face to the sky and eat the wind. That is peace, the grandmother said. So, J-A-W-N, thank you so much for having me for a couple hours. And thank you for listening to Putting Up With Me and all my crazy stories. So, if you have any questions, you're welcome to get a hold of me. I think uh, Christine or uh, the folks at the office have my email. You're welcome. I can put all the books if you want to read the poetry i can send you links and all that stuff i don't want to bug you with all that but if you're interested in any way shape or form or what i said thank you and hopefully i did not add to the confusion but was able to ground you